Ross Arnold. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how wise that is, but anyway. Um, we have a cocktail party in here. Uh, that's a little too loud. I hear it reverberating back a bit. So, um, they told me they have a cocktail party in here at 5.30, so I can't afford to go as long. Besides, I have a massage at 5.15, so this is going to be very concise. Um, I did give Travis a little bit of a head fake earlier. It says in the bulletin, and he had announced that we were doing uh, the birthplace of empires. Um, I decided, as I was putting the final touches on things, that this morning, having done the um, faith and culture in the ancient Near East, that it made most sense to go on into the specific faith issues, since we'd already gotten into that, of the three great monotheistic religions. Um, and so that's what we're going to talk about for the next hour. Um, more than half of the world's population today, I'm going to adjust something here because this is, I can't see this now. Um, and that tells me what slide I'm on. More than half of the world's population today are advocates or followers of one of the three great monotheistic religions, Christianity and Islam in terms of size, and then the original one, Judaism. And those three great monotheistic religions all have something in common, and that is all of them see themselves as having been started by Abraham, or Father Abraham, as he is known by all three of those traditions. Father Abraham is considered the world's first true monotheist because he heard God speak to him, the revelation of God, and said to him, you're, you're my guy. You're, if you will follow me and do as I say, I will be your God. You will be my person. And of you, I will make a great people, and I will give you a land to have as your own. From Judaism came Christianity. From, from Judaism and Christianity, in effect, came Islam. So all three of those great religions, more than half of the world's population, see themselves as adherents to religions that started with this one man. And so that's why our talk is called The Children of Abraham. Specifically, in the book of Genesis of the Hebrew Bible, or the Old Testament of the Christian Bible, we have the call to Abram. And again, I'm sorry, you're raising your hand? Me to go back. Oh, okay. I thought maybe you wanted to have him speak. Bob, you can get back up here if you want. Um, so the first call in the book of Genesis, the 12th chapter, the first 12 chapters of Genesis, or the first 11 chapters of Genesis, are the pre, uh, prehistoric preamble, which tell the creation of the world, uh, the Garden of Eden, the sin of humanity, and all that. But starting in chapter 12 of Genesis, we have the story of Abraham and his descendants. And so in Genesis 12, it says, The Lord had said to Abram, and again, his name at first was Abram, which means exalted father. Later on, his name gets changed by God to Abraham, which means father of many, which is part of the promise that he would be the father of many peoples. Likewise, his wife uh, Sarai, her name got changed to Sarah. There's always big name changes that happen in the Bible, whenever, Old and New Testament, whenever you have uh, a significant thing happen. So the Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left, as the Lord had told him, and Lot, his nephew, went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. Haran was in the north of Mesopotamia. He'd come up from Ur. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, the people they had acquired in Haran, they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. So all three of the great monotheistic religions claim this blessing that was given through Abraham. And then, three chapters later, there is a second call to Abraham in the 15th chapter of Genesis, in which God says, it says, He, that is God, took him, Abraham, outside and said, Look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and it was credited to him as righteousness. That, that phrase, Abram believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, gets quoted much later, you know, 2,000 years later, by the Apostle Paul as an example of what faith is. It gets quoted in Hebrews as well. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. So this, I showed you this map earlier, this is 
where um, Abram started in Ur with his father Terah still alive, or, uh, the Terah still alive, they went up to Haran. There his father died, and that's where he received the call of God. He went down into the land of Canaan, lived there for a time, and then had a sojourn into Egypt, and then came back later on. So this is Father Abraham. Now, when we talk about him being the father of all three of the great monotheistic religions, there are some different understandings of the history, especially when you get to Islam. Uh, Judaism and Christianity don't have any differences, but the fact is that the story of Abraham, who started as Abram, um, is one in which Abram and his wife Sarai were promised that God's blessing to them would be that they would have a son. In the old Semitic, his, the Semitic peoples, the ultimate blessing of God, the sign that God approved of you, was to have children, and especially to have a son. When Abraham and Sarai did not have a son, a child, there was a sense in which that meant that God wasn't really blessing them. Then God specifically called on Abram and said, I will give you a son, I will give you a whole people out of that son, and then it didn't happen, and it didn't happen, and it didn't happen. So eventually, Sarah, I'm going to just call them Abraham and Sarah from now on so we don't get confused, Sarah says to Abraham, I think you should take my handmaiden, my servant, who's called Hagar, and sleep with her, and have her have a child so that we can carry on the family, since God seems to be kind of taking his time about this whole thing. Well, this is not unique to Abraham and Sarah. Uh, there have been other ancient records that came up that show that it was fairly common for the patriarch of a, of a family group to also bear children by the servants in the family. So Hagar, the handmaiden of Sarah, goes in, sleeps with Abraham, and she has a child. In fact, she has a son, and his name is Ishmael. Well, shortly after that, Sarah gets pregnant, and she has a son whose name is Isaac, as you can see up there. I don't need to point to it. You people can see. Uh, so you have Ishmael, who is just slightly older than Isaac. As they start to grow up, Sarah starts getting jealous because Sarah says, well, Ishmael, the son of my handmaiden, my servant Hagar, technically is older. And so as they get older, he might challenge Isaac, my son, and so Sarah throws kind of a hissy fit and tells Abraham, you got to get rid of them. You've got to get rid of Hagar and Ishmael. Well, Abraham is reluctant to do that because he's worried about them. And then God gives Abraham another message and says, don't worry about them. I will take care of them. They will be fine. In fact, I will make a great people out of Ishmael too. So Hagar and Ishmael leave. They they. they they give them food and water. They go out into the desert. They actually run out of water. And there's a scene in the Old Testament in the Hebrew Bible. Forgive me for calling it the Old Testament. I'm just used to that. It is the Hebrew Bible. Um, the, where Hagar plants Ishmael, and then she goes off by herself to weep because she's sure they're going to die in the desert. And then God miraculously leads her to water. In fact, in the Islamic faith, when you go on pilgrimage, the Hajj, which is once in a lifetime, everyone is expected, at least once, to go on a pilgrimage to Mecca. And in Mecca, they part of what you do on that pilgrimage is to run back and forth in between the hills in imitation of Hagar and Ishmael, Hagar searching for water for her and her son. And that's part of, of the sort of dramatic reenactment that takes place during the Islamic pilgrimages to Mecca. So Ishmael actually does become the father of 12 different tribes. Now people usually say that he was the father of the, uh, of the Arabic people. That's true, but he was also the father of more than that. The tribes that Ishmael um, fathered, who came out of him, he had 12 sons. They actually, those tribes lived everywhere from northern Syria, Mesopotamia, all the way down to Egypt. So they were spread out a lot. In fact, a lot of the people you read about in the Bible, you know, the, the uh, Amorites and Ammonites, I mean, there's more ites than you can, you know, swing a dead cat, you couldn't help but hit an ite in, the, in those days. And a lot of those different peoples were descended from Ishmael. Isaac, who stayed with Abraham and grew up, Isaac ended up having actually two children, Jacob and Esau. I'm not going to get into the one. There are wonderful stories about Jacob and Esau. Isaac, you don't hear a whole lot about. 
but he's the, the transition to Jacob and Esau. Jacob, who later is renamed Israel, there, Israel means the one who wrestles with God, because uh, Jacob actually had a night where he wrestled with an angel, who it appears actually may have been some incarnation of God. And so Israel, Jacob, has 12 sons. They become the 12 tribes of Israel. And eventually, the 12 tribes of Israel uh, inhabit the promised land, Canaan, and that is the source of the Jewish people. Now, the interesting thing part about uh, the interesting part about this is since the Jewish and Christian tradition is that um, Isaac was born to Abraham and Sarah, and descent was from him. The Islamic faith and the Quran that Muhammad recited says that Ishmael was the key. And in fact, the whole tradition, the story which I'm sure you've heard, about Abraham taking Isaac, actually our guy got it a little bit wrong in terms of the Christian and Jewish tradition. Um, he said that when before, before Isaac was born, God had, uh, Abraham had promised God that if you give me a son, I'll sacrifice him. Well, that's not quite true. Isaac was born, Abraham, according to the, the Bible, was, um, Isaac was born, Abraham and Sarah are very happy to have a son, and then God says, Abraham, you are to take Isaac, your son, your only son whom you love. And I think God, I talk about rubbing salt in the wound, and sacrifice it to me. And Abraham, according to Jewish and Christian tradition, was obedient, takes Isaac out to uh, Mount, which the tradition again is that later on, that's the same hill that Jerusalem was built on. Did you know that? So he goes out and he's just ready to sacrifice Isaac and an angel stops him and says, no, you've proven your faith, that's what God wanted you to do, and so here is a ram stuck in this bush over here, you can sacrifice the ram instead. Interesting thing is, the Islamic faith, the Quran, says it wasn't Isaac that, uh, that was almost sacrificed, it was Ishmael. And so the story diverges there. The Islamic belief is that Ishmael was the son that was almost sacrificed by Isaac, and that Isaac continued to have a relationship with Ishmael down through the years. In fact, that Ishmael and Abraham were the ones who, who went to Mecca and went into the Kaaba, which I'll describe to you in a minute, and destroyed all the pagan idols in there, and Ishmael was right along for the ride. Okay? Now, I'll give you a couple of dates here. As we've said before, civilization, roughly speaking, the end of the Neolithic period happened about 4500 uh, 4, BC. That's when cities started to happen. That's when cultivated crops and the plow and irrigation and domesticated animals, all of that had happened by then and cities were being built. The belief is that somewhere around 2000, 2091 is the usual date, Abram obeys God and follows him. And at that point, we have the start of monotheism in the Jewish faith, or in Judaism. Around 1446 B.C., Moses, likewise, hears a call of God um, to go back to Egypt, which he had fled from after committing a murder and being afraid that he was going to be uh, prosecuted for that. He goes back by the call of God to Egypt, and he leads the Israelites out of captivity in Egypt, and then he receives the law at Mount Sinai. When he received the law of God, that's where the Jewish religion really begins. The people that became known as the people of Israel, the Hebrew people, started with Abraham, but the religion of Judaism started with Moses. He was the lawgiver. That was around 1446. About 40 years later, after wandering around in the desert because of disobedience, the Israelites enter the Promised Land which was the land of Canaan, and they confront the Canaanites and the religion, the pagan uh, polytheistic religions of the Canaanites, and in doing so, they are claiming the original promise to Abraham, that they would be given a land. That's why it's called the Promised Land, because God had promised it to the descendants of Abraham. Then in 970 BC, after King Saul is the first king of the United King of the United um, nation of Israel, and then King David, the great king, then his son Solomon. And even though David wanted to build the temple to God, God said, no, you are, you're a warrior, you're a man of blood. And because of that, uh, because you are a conqueror, even though you did it because I told you to, God says, 
um, it's not for you to build my temple, the place of worship, and so your son Solomon will. Solomon built the temple starting about 970, and the temple in Jerusalem was literally considered the house of God. You, you all hear the expression about churches. Churches are the house of God, right? Well, the, the Israelites believed the temple in Jerusalem really was the place on earth where God lived. The presence of God, the Shekinah it was called, the glory of God, literally resided over top the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies in the inner sanctum of the temple. And as I said this morning, when the Babylonians, right before the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and the temple in 586 B.C., we have the story in the book of Jeremiah where the presence of God literally came up and left the temple. They believed that God resided there. Now, it wasn't limited to that. The Jewish belief is that God is everywhere at once. But he made a special point of living in the presence of his people, in the midst of his people, um, in that temple after Jerusalem was built. We then, at the end of that millennium, um, at, at, because our timeline splits at the time of Christ, about 6 B.C., now, the people who sat down to figure out the calendar and decided to change it from, from before Christ to A.D., from B.C. to A.D. to Anno Domini, they got it wrong. It's, everybody agrees now. They, they got the dates wrong. We believe that Jesus was probably born as a Jew in Bethlehem, where we're going to visit about 6 B.C., somewhere between 4 and 6 B.C. And you say, well, why don't you know? Wasn't this important? They didn't keep track of those things back then. Birth dates were not important. Nobody knew when they were born back then. So Jesus, we believe, was born around 6 B.C., maybe 4 B.C. About 24 B.C., when he was about 30 years old, Jesus begins a ministry. It is a ministry of healing, miraculous healing from disease and driving out of demons. If you don't accept the reality of demons, you're really going to have trouble reading the New Testament because demons were real spiritual beings. Jesus drove out a lot of demons. He also preached, and what he preached was the good news, or gospel, which means good news, that God loved the people, he wanted to redeem the people, and he was going to do it through the, the present incarnate kingdom of God, which was Jesus himself. And so the belief was, from the preaching and teaching of Jesus, that he, wasn't, that he was actually a divine being. He was part of God. I'm going to talk about the Trinity. When I, I'm going to talk about beliefs in a minute. I'll talk about the Trinity. Somebody asked me to explain about the Holy Spirit. I'll get to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in a few minutes. But Jesus started his ministry. He had, a, we believe, a three-year-long ministry. At about 27 B.C., Jesus was arrested at the instigation of the Jewish leaders who felt like he was threatening their authority. He was arrested they convinced the Romans, Pontius Pilate, a name you have heard, to crucify Jesus for sedition, for being against the religion and against the government. He was crucified, but then the testimony of his followers was that he came back from the dead. He was resurrected on the third day, came back from the dead, and ascended into heaven. And that is the basis of the Christian belief in Jesus, is the resurrection. Without the physical resurrection of Jesus, Christianity would not exist as it does. And then, jumping ahead, Christianity was illegal. At first it was persecuted only by the Jewish people. Then in the 60s, around AD 60, Nero started persecuting Christians in Rome because they were blaming Nero for, for Rome burning down, and he needed to blame it on somebody else to get the heat off himself, literally, so to speak. And so he found these Christians who were not very popular amongst the Romans because they refused to go along with pagan worship. In the Roman days, in the first century, if you went to anything, they would start out with a recognition of the Roman gods. If you went to dinner with friends, they would have a libation to the gods. If you went to you know, the Hippodrome to see the, the chariots race, they would start out acknowledging the gods. Well, the Christians couldn't do that because they believed there was only one God who was represented in Jesus Christ, so they were very unpopular because they seemed like they were antisocial. So the first 300 years of Christianity, they went through various phases of persecution. Nero's persecution was just in Rome. Later on, we had, there was virulent uh, persecution under Domitian and then Diocletian. Under Trajan, there was an active persecution. These are all Roman emperors. But there was a sense in which if somebody, you don't, don't go looking for them, but if somebody blames a Christian for something, 
you have to take it seriously. And so a lot of people were persecuted, a lot of Christians, for that reason. But in 321, they're about, Christ, uh, Constantine, the new emperor of the Roman Empire, made Christianity legal. Late in the 300s, it then became the official religion of the Roman Empire. But the time of the greatest growth of Christianity was in that first 300 years, when it was illegal. And yet, this was the monotheism, the belief in one God that people were looking for, that did not carry with it all of the expectations of Judaism. All right? So that's the first two of the great monotheistic religions. Judaism, the basis, and then Christianity, which came out of it, and, it, and was perceived for a long time just as a Jewish sect, but then differentiated itself. And then we have Islam. Islam started in 570 AD when Muhammad was born in Mecca. Now, uh, Muhammad was a very quiet, thoughtful guy. He wandered around the hills. He would sit in caves and meditate. And about 610, when he was about 40 years old, he was a businessman, nothing special about him till then. About 40 years old in 610, Muhammad began to receive revelations he believed from God. This was a time when most, well, all of Saudi Arabia and much of the rest of the world, with the exception of the Jews, were polythe polytheistic. They were worshiping multiple gods. Muhammad received a revelation from God that there was one God, Allah, which is uh, uh, Arabic for God, and that he wanted Muhammad to be his prophet. Muhammad was illiterate, so he did not write the Quran, but rather he recited it. Quran means the recitation. He recited it to people, he started teaching it to get followers. Later on, his followers wrote down the Quran, and he continued to have visions until 632. Around 622, the actual movement of Islam as a religious system began. Um, in Mecca, they didn't want to, nobody wanted to follow him. He had trouble there. They drove him out of town. And in 622 was when he had the Hajira. The Hajira is, or migration in Arabic, was when um, Muhammad and his followers left Mecca, where he was not received, and went north to a town that became known as Medina. There he was received, he, he spread his message, he got more followers. Later on, he went back with an army and conquered uh, Mecca. He died in 632, and it was at that point that he had a series of successors, or caliphs. Caliph is the Arabic word for successor. Um, that was the point at which there was a split between Sunni Islam and Shia Islam. Some of the people, after Muhammad's death, he didn't have any male heirs. He didn't appoint a successor. Most of his followers said whoever is the most noble or worthy of the, of the believers in Allah and in Muhammad's message, then the most worthy should be the one. And, and they selected Abu Bakr, who is uh, Muhammad's follower, one of his, or I'm sorry, his father-in-law, one of his early followers. The Shia group, a smaller group, said no, it should be a relation, a blood relation to Muhammad. And so they advocated that it should be somebody, uh, he didn't have any sons, but his older daughter Fatima. They said that, that uh, Fatima's husband, Ali, was the closest male relative they had in terms of blood, so Ali should become the, the new successor, the caliph. And they fought over this. In fact, some of the early campaigns of the, of the Muslims under Abu Bakr were to fight against the people who advocated that he shouldn't be the caliph. They had a period of called the Four Wise Caliphs, where they began to spread by military campaign, let's face it, throughout northern Africa, the whole eastern Mediterranean region, all, all the way across northern, northern Africa. But the Shia um, decided they couldn't follow that. Later on, some of, the, some of the other relatives of Muhammad did become the caliphs. But today, 85% of all Muslims are Sunni, Sunni is, um, is, well, Turkey is Sunni Muslim. And the Sunnis tend to be less virulent, less whatever you'd want to say. The Shia, which is represented, the largest group of Shia, are in Iran. The Ayatollahs, uh, Ayatollah, the word literally means a sign of God. And so they believe the Ayatollahs are God's messengers. They tend to be much more conservative in their beliefs, the Shia Islam. Uh, followers, they tend to be more committed to the old faith. They're fundamentalists. I mean, if you understand that, the Shia is much more fundamentalist. The Sunni are much more uh, easygoing about the whole thing. There are other sort of subgroups within Islam. 
um, I, I mentioned this to some people earlier today, as groups, the most conservative, the most restrictive of all the Islamic groups, in the, and I'm not talking about individuals like Osama bin Laden, etc., because individual is Islamists get radical about things, but the most conservative body of Islam is Wahhabism. It comes from a theologian named Wahhabi, um, who uh, in the 18th century, or 19th century, sorry, was advocating a return to Islam the way Muhammad practiced it. And Wahhabism today is the dominant form of Islam in Saudi Arabia. It is the most restrictive. Women are not allowed to drive. It is very restrictive in Saudi Arabia. That is Wahhabism. But you don't hear much about that. Let's face it, it's because Saudi Arabia is an ally of the West, whereas some of the other countries have not been. And so we hear more about them as being radical. The most radically conservative of all Islam is Wahhabism in Saudi Arabia. Okay, just interesting fact. All right? I'm going to talk about each of these groups now individually and what they believe. Any questions about that sort of general overview? Anything jumped out at you that you want me to talk about first? Yes? So the Afghanis are uh, Shias. Well, the Afghan Afghanistan is split. The Taliban is Shia. There's part of Afghanistan that actually would be Sunni. Uh, but, but Afghanistan being right on the border, you know, uh, there, it, it's, I think it's predominantly Shia, but there are some Sunnis there as well. It's not, you know, uh, uh, Iran is almost entirely Shia. Iraq is significantly uh, Sunni. And so the reason why, one of the reasons why Iraq and Iran have been fighting each other forever is because Sunni and Shia have been fighting each other forever. The Sunnis have felt God has blessed us. They had a golden age where they grew... Uh, they, they had great learning and universities and all that kind of stuff that was mostly Sunni. And they feel like this is an example God blessed us. The Shia, on the other hand, have a history of persecution. They look at the fact that the Sunnis have persecuted them. They have killed the leaders. And, and they say that's a sign that we are the right guys and we're on God's side. You know, go figure. And yet there is very much a sense amongst the Shia believers that they are a persecuted minority and that's what makes it, that's why you get a very strong, like, you know, Ayatollah Khomeini and all those. There is no compromise in them, partly because they feel they're a persecuted minority. Yes? Is Muhammad a belief or is he a descendant of Ishmael? Uh, well, probably. We don't have a direct line, you know, uh, there's no genealogy done to it. He, Ishmael, was the predecessor to peoples that settled in the Arabian Peninsula, as well as others, like I say, from Egypt all the way up to Syria. But um, they would claim that, yes. But not all descendants of Ishmael are Arabic, nor are all descendants of Ishmael um, Muslim. Okay, people, people have that misunderstanding. But um, it is believed that the, Ara the Arabic peoples from whom Muhammad came probably were descendants of Ishmael. But like I say, we don't have letters. Nobody's done the genealogy on it because that was a long time ago. Okay, Danny? What were the Fatimid Shiites? Well, the Fatimid Shiites, remember the oldest child of Muhammad and his wife was Fatima, a woman. And the later on, I mean, there were several different, I said earlier, everyone thinks that Islam is this monolithic, one leadership, everybody's pulling together. That's not at all true. It hasn't been true between the Shia, uh, Sunni and Shia. And then at various times in their history, various branches of that family took uh, control. For instance, the Uyamid, um, after the four, four wise caliphs, the Uyamid uh, dynasty happened. They're the ones that took over the Iberian Peninsula. And then the Abbasid dynasty, a different arm of Islam, uh, descended from, from Muhammad's followers took over and they made their center of Baghdad and then the Fatima dynasty which was established in North Africa ultimately in Cairo in fact they founded Cairo the Fatima dynasty claimed that they were descended from the children of Fatima that's where you get Fatima dynasty and they claimed a direct lineage back to Muhammad not just Muhammad's followers but a bloodline from Muhammad and they were really restricted they were Shia actually one of the strongest of the Shia movements in the history of Islam. Yes? Where do the Alawites fit in? Are they Shia? The Alawites. I don't know the expression, Alawite. The ones that uh, the leader of Syria is an Alawite. Okay. I really... I, yeah, they're Shia. What I know, I know well, but what I don't know is amazing. So, I don't know Alawite. I'm sorry. Uh, yes? So, so, can we associate 
the jihad, the, the holy war, with the Shias? No. No. Okay. Um, and okay. let me get to that a little bit later okay. as I okay. talk about, about the beliefs. Okay. Uh, jihad, in fact, Muhammad, um, when, when some of his followers were out <laughs> fighting a battle and they came back and said, we've been fighting the jihad. Jihad means holy war. And he said, you've been fighting the lesser jihad. The greater jihad is in here. In other words, the greater war that you have to fight is to bring yourself in line. And so Muhammad actually, while there was military conquest, there was a sense in which that wasn't the main point. Today, when they declare a jihad, holy war, that's usually an Islamist. When it's not, there's a difference in Islam and Islamists. The Islamists are the, the radical, militant, uh, pro-Islam, anti-Western kind of views. There is no one movement that you can say represents Islamism today. They come, some of them have come out of um, Shia. I mean, we think of that because the, the, there are whole countries like Iran that are predominantly Shia, and they seem not to like us very much. But, um, again, Wahhabism in Saudi Arabia, you may remember that when 9-11 happened, the largest body, more than half of the people responsible for flying the planes into the buildings at 9-11 were from Saudi Arabia, not from Iran. You know, so it's, you can't, there's no clear line that. Some, some of the radical Islamists, those who were most militant and desire to have war and claim jihad against the West, are Sunni. Some are Shia. Some are from smaller sects. Some are Wahhabists. You can't really say one is responsible for all the bad stuff, okay? Having said, I will answer that later. I just answered that. Yes. Just look back to the Christian calendar for a second. Sure. What about it? I'm having trouble with the progression there from 6 BC. Oh, it's AD. Should be I'm sorry. These should be AD. 24 and 27 should be AD. Okay. That's a mistake. Oops. Sorry. It should be 6 BC. Jesus was born. 24 AD. He begins his ministry. 27 AD. He is crucified. Sorry about that. Just a typo. Okay, let's talk about Judaism. Judaism, the first great, in fact, the first monotheistic religion. I want to give you a couple of numbers here. Total world population right now is about 7.1 billion. You can go online and see that adding up. 7.11, 752, 753, 754. They're actually clocks that count the population. Christians worldwide, about 2.1 billion. Islamic uh, people or Muslims worldwide, 1.5 billion. Hindus, about 900 million. Buddhists, about 376 million. Sikhs, the Sikh religion I mentioned briefly this morning, about 19 million. Just to give you an idea, all right? I showed you some numbers this morning. Muslims, just in the country of Indonesia, one country, which is the most populous Islamic, or the most pos po uh, populous Muslim country, there are 183 million Muslims just in Indonesia. Southern Baptists in the United States, we have any Southern Baptists in the group? Ah, oh, good for you. I was saved as a Southern Baptist, okay? Um, 16 million. Total number of Jews in the world, 14 million. And in fact, Jews constitute 0.2%, one five hundredth of the population of the planet today. Had it not been for the Holocaust, which was the worst of a whole series of persecutions the Jewish people have suffered over the years, the, the persecution, sorry, the persecution, that's all right, just surprised me. The persecution of the Jewish people began as far back as the book of Esther. And or, when I say persecution, I mean an organized, even, even politically uh, organized persecution. The book of Esther is about exactly that. And regularly through the history of the Jewish people, there have been efforts to try to destroy them. The pogroms in Russia, and on and on and on. Down to, of course, the horror, horror of the Holocaust. And so that's one of the reasons we have such a small population. It's only been just recently there are more Jews in Israel than there are in the rest of the world. It used to be there were more Jews in New York City than there were in all of Israel. And that's not true. The migration, you know, the right of return of Jewish people to Israel, uh, the population is growing there. Now... Despite the fact there are only one five hundredth of the population, I mentioned this morning, Jews have received 22% of all Nobel Prizes. Jews are, are a major force in entertainment, medicine, law, on and on. You pick a field, and the Jews will excel at it. This is one of the reasons why 
Alexander the well, first Julius Caesar and uh, well, first Alexander the Great liked the Jewish people when he came to and he left them alone. He did not attack Jerusalem. For one thing, they showed him the book of Daniel, which says that, that out of Greece will come a power that will destroy the Persians. And Alexander went, I'm here, that's me. Well, later on, Julius Caesar gave, like the Jewish people, thought they were educated and cultured, and he gave them the freedom to live wherever they wanted. Likewise, Caesar's heir, Augustus Caesar, the first true emperor, Julius Caesar was dictator for life, but the first emperor was Augustine, his, his uh, adopted heir. Uh, and Augustine did the same thing. The Jews could live anywhere they want. That's why the Jews were the only people who were exempted from emperor worship starting with Julius Caesar and Augustus. Why? Because they did not believe in any god but the one true god, Yahweh. They would not worship the emperor or any other gods, and the Romans let them get away with it. Unfortunately, well, fortunately, Christians were okay when they were thought of as being just a sect of Judaism, but when it was finally established that they weren't really Jews, then the Christians started being persecuted. But the Jews were left alone, for the most part, until AD 70, when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem. So Judaism, as I said, goes back to Abraham as the father who started the people. But the religion of Judaism started with Moses, the lawgiver. And this is the call to Moses from Exodus 3. But Moses said to God, God had called Moses and said, you know, I want you to go back to Egypt and bring my people out of, out of slavery from under Pharaoh. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, the, the most powerful person in the world at that time, and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that I, it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain, Mount Sinai. Although there's a lot of disagreement about where that is. Anybody that says, oh, it's absolutely right here. Well, we're not sure. <laughs> Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they, they ask me, what is his name? Then what, am I, what shall I tell them? Moses is trying to get out of this, by the way. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. I am, in ancient Hebrew, is Yahweh. It's a four-letter expression called the tetragrammaton, or the four letters. And that becomes the proper name of God. It literally means, I am who I am, means I am completely self-sufficient. I am independent of any other cause. I am the unmoved mover, the uncaused cause. I am the one true God upon which, I, upon which everything else depends, and I depend on nothing. That's what that name means. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, throughout all of the Hebrew Bible, that's how God is referred to, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the three patriarchs. Okay? That he has sent me to you, this is my name forever, the name by which I will be remembered from generation to generation. And then we have, again, another call. Um, God made sure they understood this. He kept repeating things. <laughs> then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain. This is at Mount Sinai later. And said, this is what you are to say to the house of Jacob, and what you are to, to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. God made them the chosen people of God. He gave them his law. He instructed them through Moses. Of course, Moses came back down the hill after this, and they were worshiping a golden, golden calf, and it got kind of crazy. Uh, but they worked it all out. So... <laughs> The gift that was given to Moses, I mentioned earlier, is the Torah. The Torah is the first five books of Moses. Genesis, we know them as Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It means law or instruction. Some people re refer generally to the whole of the Hebrew Bible as Torah, but more literally, it's the first five books. Later on, were added other inspired writings, Nevaim, which are the prophets, and the Ketuvim, which are the writings. So the Hebrew Bible is God's revelation initially started by being given through Moses. Now, what are the basic beliefs of, of Judaism? Obviously, there are the Ten Commandments. You may or may not know that the Ten Commandments aren't all the laws in the Hebrew Bible. They're, a law or commandment is called the mitzvot in Hebrew. 
There are 613 mitzvah, or, uh, which are plural for mitzvah, in the Hebrew Bible. These are the top ten. These are the big ten. Uh, the Ten Commandments as we know them that Moses brought down from the mountain and then God filled in a lot of other uh, commandments later. One, you shall have no other gods before me. Remember I told you that the Hebrew people even probably were henotheistic at first and God is making a point here of saying don't think there are any other gods you can follow or worship. There are no other gods before me. I'm first. Second, you shall make, no, make or worship, uh, you shall not make or worship any idols. Third, you shall not take the name of God in vain. The name Yahweh, the Hebrew people would not pronounce it. Whenever they came to that word in the Hebrew Bible as they were reading it, which they do as part of worship, they would say instead Adonai, which means Lord. So they would substitute it as they were reading. Number four, you um, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, doing no work on that day. I should say the reason they wouldn't do that is because they wanted to make absolutely sure they didn't make a mistake and in some way take it in vain. So that's why they wouldn't even pronounce it. That way they would be sure they wouldn't. Number five, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy, do no work on that day. The day that and, and God says, for six days I labored, creating the universe. On the seventh day I rested, you do the same. This was a great gift to the Jewish people. Now later on, Jesus complained that the Pharisees and others had made this a burden. But the whole point of it originally was, you used to be slaves in Egypt, where you were expected to work all day long, all night long, seven days a week, you don't have to do that anymore. I'm giving you a great gift. One day a week you rest, you study, you worship, you do the things that enlighten your soul, but your body doesn't have to be worn out seven days a week. Okay? So this was a great gift. Number five, honor your father and your mother. Number six, do not murder. Number seven, do not, not commit adultery. Number eight, do not steal. Number nine, do not bear false witness against your neighbor. Number ten, do not cover your neighbor's house or wife or manservant or maidservant or ox or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. I've abbreviated these, by the way, in order to get them all on one slide, but you get the idea. The last of these, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, don't covet, is why we say this is an ethical monotheism. Those kind of rules didn't exist in previous religions. The pagan, the Greek gods did all sorts of horrible things. And so there was no sense in which if you worship those gods, you had to be a good person. Judaism comes along and says... God is a good God. He is a righteous and moral God. He is a loving God. And if you're going to serve Him, you've got to be that way too. And so it is an ethical monotheism. Frequently, uh, we say that the first five commandments are about our relationship with God. The second five commandments are about our, our relationship with each other. Now, you think, well, number five is honor your father and your mother. How's that about God? Our fathers and our mothers are God's representative the authority figures that God has, rep has appointed to bring us into the world and also to raise us. And so obedience to the parents was always understood by the Jewish people as being an aspect of obedience to God. All right? Now, these are the Ten Commandments, and as I say, there are a total of 613 commandments or mitzvot, uh, mitzvot in the Hebrew Bible. But uh, there's uh, another approach to this. Maimonides was a great, probably the greatest of all Jewish scholars and theologians, and he, in the, uh, the 12th century, created the 13 principles of Judaism, which is the most universally accepted outline of Jewish beliefs today. Um, Maimonides is sometimes called Rambam, which is, a, which is a cool name, Rambam, and it's actually an acronym from Rabbi, you know, uh, Maimonides, his whole name. Anyway, we won't get into that. Um, First, Ram Bam, Maimonides said God exists and he is the creator. And again, there's a lo there are longer versions of this. I'm giving you a shorthand. Second, God is one and unique. There is none other like him. Nobody else to compete with him. In fact, in the Hebrew Bible, in the book of Deuteronomy, there is the Shema, which was a call to worship amongst the Jews for, for the, down through the millennia. It is Shema Yisrael Yahweh Elchenu Yahweh Echelu, which means... Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one God. And that's what's being reflected here in Maimonides. Okay? Third, God is not physical. He is spirit. Fourth, God is eternal. He's always been. Eternal doesn't mean he's not going to die. It means he is never. He didn't have a start. He won't have a finish. He is always. Number five, prayer is to be directed only to God. Back to that not, no graven images thing. Six, the words of the prophets are true. Now, that's plural. 
By prophets, we mean Moses was the greatest of the prophets. We mention him separately. But all of the prophets of the Old Testament, those who contribute the Nevi'im, the prophetic writings, but the prophets that were inspired by God. And then, particularly, the prophecies of Moses are true. Moses was the, the chief of all the prophets. Then the Torah was given to Moses. All right, God gave the law, the instruction is a better word probably, to Moses. There, there uh, will be no other Torah. That's it, the canon is closed. The word canon, which you sometimes hear, C-A-N-O-N, -N, not, not C-A-N-N-O-N, C-A-N-O-N, literally means the yardstick, the thing by which things are measured. And so when we talk about the canon of Scripture, we mean the authoritative books which have been accepted by people of faith as having come from God. This is saying that Hebrew Bible, can, the canon of the Hebrew Bible is closed. No more Torah. Number 10, God knows the thoughts and deeds of all. Number 11, God rewards the good and punishes the wicked. Number 12, the Messiah will come. There has been a Jewish expectation for a Messiah since the very start. When God called Abraham, he said, Abraham, you be my guy, I will be your God, I will make of you a great people, I will give your people a land in which they can live, and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. That all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you was restated with Isaac, Abraham's son, with Jacob, and it was repeated down to all the prophets. And much of that had to do with the expectation of a Messiah, especially after King David that another one in the line of David, like King David, would come and again make Israel great, would, would drive off all their oppressors, and would be God's representative to lead the people the way David had. Okay? And sort of a combination of Father Abraham, Moses the lawgiver, and David the great king would be the Messiah. And there had always been an expectation for that. And 13th, the dead will be resurrected. There is a sense of resurrection for the Jewish people, but not the same sense of heaven. In fact, salvation to the Jewish people, speaking historically, has always been interpreted as a return from exile. And so when they talk about the dead will be resurrected, in effect, they will return from the exile of death, and there will be an eternity, not, not a heavenly kind of picture, it's a very different sense of afterlife, but there is a belief that the dead would be resurrected. One of the big differences between the Pharisees and the Sadducees in the first century during the time of Christ. In fact, if you read the book of Acts, it's very funny. Paul, the Apostle Paul, was a smart guy. When he's brought before the Sanhedrin, he says, well, the reason I'm brought here today is because I've been preaching the resurrection from the dead. And all heck breaks loose. Because the Sadducees, who were in charge of the Sanhedrin, the political leaders, did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. In fact, you'll note, it was a Sadducee who came to Jesus and said, okay, i got a question for you. <laughs> Try to answer this one. A man dies, and according to the, the Leveret law, that the, the, uh, the man's brother marries his wife. The idea was, amongst the Jewish tradition, that you marry your, your brother's widow so that you can have children in his name to keep the line going. Well, that brother dies, she marries the third brother. That brother dies, she marries the fourth brother. That brother dies, she marries the fifth brother. And the guy said to Jesus, so who's she married to in heaven? Neener, neener. <laughs> and the reason that was a trick question is because that was being asked by a Sadducee who did not believe in resurrection from the dead, did not believe there was an afterlife. It makes all the difference who was asking the question. And Jesus said, you really don't get it, do you? All right? And then he, he said, there will be neither, uh, neither marriage or giving in marriage in heaven, and he goes on. Uh, they never did trick him when he, they asked those questions. But the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. They didn't believe in angels or demons. They, they didn't believe in the rest of the Tanakh beyond the Torah. The Pharisees did. So when Paul asked that question to the Sanhedrin, or when he said to them, the reason I'm here is because I've been preaching the resurrection, and I got arrested for that. The Sadducees and the Pharisees start fighting each other over it. The, Sa the Pharisees say, we like him. He's a good guy. And the Sadducees go, no, no. And so they all get in a fight, and Paul gets to leave with the Roman guards. Right? <laughs> Judaism, as I mentioned, has always been persecuted. As the chosen people of God, they have always, through their history, been driven out, persecuted. People have tried to exterminate them. In fact, this is an example of some of the, the diaspora between 70 and 500 B.C., they travel from Palestine to all parts of Europe. At various times, they have been thrown out of Spain. They have been thrown out of England. They have been thrown out of parts of France. 
Um, and still, the Jewish people survive and are a dominant factor in Western culture, and have always been. Mark Twain said, all things are mortal but the Jew. All other forces pass, but the Jew remains. What is the secret of his immortality? It said that, that in medieval times, um, a, a ruler asked his very wise servant, um, give me one example, one proof for the existence of God. And his servant very calmly said, the existence of the Jewish people. Jeremiah 30 says, Jacob will again have peace and security and no one will make him afraid. Jacob is a synonym for Israel, the people of Israel. I am with you and will save you, declares the Lord. Though I completely destroy all the nations among you, which I scatter you, I will not completely destroy you. I will discipline you, but only with justice. I will not let you go entirely unpunished. God says, I will discipline you if you go wrong. I will never let you be completely destroyed, his people. Questions about Judaism? Okay, let's talk about the second great monotheistic religion, Christianity. Christianity started within Judaism. It was a sect of Judaism. Jesus was a Jew. All of his early followers were Jew. All of his apostles were Jewish. Um, all of the disciples were Jewish. All of the early converts were Jews. The first church was in Jerusalem. The first great sermon, evangelistic sermon by uh, Peter in the second chapter of Acts, in which he got 3,000 converts, all of those converts were Jewish. It wasn't until later that they spread out to um, parts of Samaria and north into Syria that they began to get Jewish uh, Gentile converts, non-Jewish converts. In fact, that was such a big issue that the whole, read the 15th chapter of the book of Acts, they had to have a special council in Jerusalem to decide, what are we going to do with these Gentiles? Do they have to become Jews in order to be a follower of Jesus? Do they have to be circumcised and follow the dietary laws? And the decision was no, they don't. Because if we expect that of them, then... Um, and they'd already had evidence, miraculous evidence, they thought that God was blessing them. So they said, no, they don't have to. So Jesus Christ, Christ being the Greek word that's the same as Messiah, which means the anointed one. Again, remember the Jewish people had been waiting for a Messiah for thousands of years. It's reiterated through many of the prophetic writings. Um, and so the idea amongst those Jews, and amongst some Jews today who believe that, who are Messianic Jews, they're called, is that Jesus it was and is the Messiah that the Jewish people had been waiting for since the ancient times recorded in the Hebrew Bible. Um, conservative Jewish people do not agree with that. All right? And that's, that's why you have a separation between Judaism and Christianity. The basic beliefs of Christianity. First, the belief is there is one God. It is a monotheistic religion, which conservative Jews and Muslims would say, no, it's not. You believe in three gods. The reason being because Christianity believes the one God reveals himself in three persons, which is called the Holy Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, who was Jesus Christ, the divine Son of God, and God the Holy Spirit, that it is a unity that shares one substance. People say, how in the world can that be? Well, there have been efforts to come up with analogies throughout history for this. Um, it, the, the story goes that St. Patrick converted the, the pagans of Ireland by describing the Trinity using a three-leaf clover, which is why the three-leaf clover is the, is the symbol of Ireland now, because that was what, again, tradition says, Patrick used to convert them. By, that's how he explained the Trinity. Um, some people use the analogy of an egg. An egg has a shell, it has a white, it has a yolk. Three very distinct parts, but together they make one egg. I struggled for years as the best analogy for, to come up with, and I finally came up with me. <laughs> because a human being, we understand, I have a mind, I have a spirit, the part of me that responds to things that are not cognitive, things like loyalty and love and honor, things that are not, you know, data-oriented, and I also have a physical body. It's possible for my body to uh, die, in effect, of, to not have any, any motion, and for my mind to continue for a while. It's possible for my mind to leave and for my body to still function. So I am one being that has three quite distinct parts that are dependent upon one another, but each has their responsibilities. To me, that's how to understand uh, the Trinity. That it is one substance, one being, that has three different 
parts or person. But again, Jew, uh, conservative Jews and Muslims say, you guys are polytheists. You worship three gods. Well, that is not the Christian doctrine. And I'm not pitching anything here. I'm trying to be very balanced in presenting Judaism, Christianity, and Islam in terms of what they believe. But the Trinity is a basic difference, and it's, it's what the Christians believe. There is also the belief, and this will resonate in terms of what we just said about uh, Judaism, God is all-knowing, he is all-powerful, he is all-present or omnipresent. He created the world as being distinct from himself. That's important because some Eastern religions, which are pantheistic or panentheistic, and if you don't know what those mean, come and ask me later, they believe that God and his creation are one thing, they're the same. That's not Jewish belief, that's not the Christian or Islamic belief. God made the world as distinct from himself, but he is still active within it as creator, as sustainer, and as sanctifier, who makes it holy, who gives us righteousness. The belief in Christianity is that Jesus was and is the promised Messiah that the Jews have been talking about for a long time, that he is the co-eternal, I mean, he's, in, he's also eternal, forever, divine Son of God who became a human man, Jesus, but was fully God and fully man. This was part of the creeds. In fact, the early church councils all had to do with trying to figure out how, how do we understand Jesus being God and human. And so they came up with definitions that he is fully God and fully man, of one substance with the Father, co-eternal with the Father. That is the Christian belief. And the belief that no one can earn God's mercy or be righteous in, in God's eyes, but that one can receive forgiveness and mercy and even righteousness by accepting Jesus as God's Son, who sacrificed himself on the cross to atone for human sins. Christianity believes in original sin, that the fall of our most ancient ancestors introduced a plague into the human creature. That plague, which is sin, we're all born with it. And we all struggle against the inclination to do evil. An old roommate of mine used to say, you know, some of these religions say that everybody's basically good. And he said, I keep thinking, if, it's, if I'm basically good, why is it so hard to be good and so easy to be bad? Well, that's a good way of describing the doctrine of original sin. That Christians believe we all have sin in us, and that sin can only be taken away by, not by any human effort, but because God himself, in the person of Jesus Christ, sacrificed himself. The idea is we were made for a relationship with God, and that relationship was broken by sin. God is a holy God. He cannot look on sin. Jesus Christ, being both fully human and fully God, rebuilt that bridge. He remade the connection, made that possible. That's the Christian doctrine, okay? Obviously, Christian doctrine is expounded in the Bible. It includes both the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament, and also the New Testament, the writing of those who were close associates. Every one of the books of the New Testament it was written either by somebody who was present with Jesus or someone who got the information from someone present from Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the traditional view is that Matthew and John were two of the apostles. Mark was an assistant and secretary for Peter. So the Gospel of Mark is very much the Gospel according to Peter. And Luke was a, a friend and follower of Paul, and in the process he ended up interviewing everybody who was still alive from the time of Jesus, and that's the Gospel of Luke. As I've said before, by A.D. 70, all right, just 40 years or so after the death of Jesus, Christianity had spread massively, even though it was technically uh, persecuted and not legal. A.D. 60s was when Nero persecuted Christianity, and by 565, Christianity had grown this much, much larger than the Roman Empire, which is the Green Line. Um, and even the barbarian tribes in, in Europe had been converted to Christianity. Not by force, but by will. Today, Christianity has several components. There is Roman Catholicism. There is Orthodoxy. I told you in the in, when we talked about uh, some of the history stuff, in 1054, there was a big split between the Eastern Church, which spoke Greek and was led by Constantinople and the Patriarch there, and Western Christianity, I guess I should do it this way, Western Christianity, that was um, spoke Latin and was under the Pope in Rome. And that split still exists today, sort of locked in by the Crusades. And even under Orthodoxy, there's various flavors of it. There's Eastern Orthodoxy, which is the largest. Um, you have churches like the Greek Orthodox Church, the Russian Orthodox Church, etc. Then you've got Oriental Orthodoxy, which includes some things like the, uh, the Coptic Church of, um, of Ethiopia and others. And then Protestantism, which if you all count yourself as Christian, 
you're either Catholic or Protestant, probably. It doesn't mean you can't be uh, Orthodox, but that's not as, as common in, in the West. Um, the, great, the four greatest forms after the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century that came out of the Reformation were Lutheran, Reformed, which is what Presbyterians are, for instance, which was the, the theology of John Calvin, Anglican, which is the Church of England that Henry VIII started. The only thing that Henry VIII started really was the Church of, of England, uh, Anglican Church, didn't follow the Pope, but everything else looked Catholic. Okay. Uh, and then the Anabaptists. The Anabaptists became the, the Brethren, the Moravian Brethren, and some others. The Baptists, in case you're wondering, Baptists, the Baptists didn't come out of the Anabaptists. Right? The Baptists came out of the Anglicans. Um, kind of complicated. Uh, this chart, which you cannot read, but you might want to come up and look at at some point, breaks it down into those four movements and then all the different denominations and churches that came out of that. Okay? Questions about Christianity? Oh, the things you now know. <laughs> Islam. I'm going to spend just a few minutes talking about Islam. I'm going to make that 515 massage. So, um, As we said earlier, Islam started in the 6th century AD with the birth of the prophet Muhammad. And Muhammad was a businessman when he was 40 years old. Uh, he began to have visions that God gave him. And he was told to recite the Quran. That's what Quran means, is the recitation. This is an example of an illustrated Quran. The Quran is so beloved, it is believed to be the very word of God. In a much more literal way than the Jews consider the Hebrew Bible the word of God, or Christians believe the New Testament and the Old Testament are the word of God. I mean, the, what I mean by if they even, even more literally believe it's the Word of God, they believe it should only truly be read and spoken in Arabic. They believe that since this is the Word of God and God gave it to Muhammad in Arabic, then Arabic is God's language. And so any translation of the Quran into English or any other language, they don't consider a translation, they consider it a commentary because it's not really the Quran. And so they feel very strongly about that. If you become Islamic, it doesn't matter where you live, you are expected to at least learn enough Arabic to be able to read and speak the Quran. And speaking of the Quran, the recitation, since that's what it means, is a huge part of what the Islamic faith is about. This lower right is a, cal uh, is a calligraphy of the name of Muhammad. I mentioned before that um, starting here in Mecca and then Medina, this brown part is the part that had become followers of Muhammad and Islam during his life. It then spread out into various areas, into Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, um, all the way up to Armenia, through the, the Syria, the Middle East, Egypt. The reason why this purple part is that later on, after the, this part is the four wise caliphs. Then the uh, Umayyad um, Muslims took over and they expanded it even further. And so this part of the world became Islamic. What are the basic beliefs of Islam? The Muslim faith and Muslim life is much more about orthopraxy, which means right action, literally it means right action, than it is about orthodoxy, which means right belief. The Eastern Orthodox faith, they believe they have the right beliefs. and so. But Islam is more about action than it is about what you believe. Now, there are certain things you have to believe if you're going to be a, a correct Muslim. But it's about how you live. And that how you live, the orthopraxy, is based upon three things. First and foremost, absolutely, is the Quran, the recitation of God's own word through Muhammad to the people. The second is the hadith. The hadith are the sayings of Muhammad. Now, in other words, Muhammad, believed to be the prophet, spoke not just the Quran, but he also told people, he did interpretations. He spoke about how you should live your life and how they're supposed to live. So throughout his whole life, they recorded his sayings. That's now called the Hadith. That is not equal to the Quran in terms of authority, but it is considered uh, authoritative and important. And thirdly, the Sunnah, which are the life examples of Muhammad. Everything about the Prophet Muhammad's life, how he treated his wife, how he lived his social life, how he dressed, how he talked, all are considered instructive to Muslims since that time, the last 1400 years. And so that Sunnah, the life examples of Muhammad, have been recorded 
there are whole schools of Islamic theology to try to decide which ones are accurate, which ones got made up. All right, and so this is very important. Now, since the revelation, as I said, to Muhammad was in Arabic, this is considered the holy language, the very language of God, and is very important to them. The word Islam means submission, because the whole focus, remember, orthopraxy, right action. The whole religion is oriented towards submitting yourself to God, Allah, and His will. There are five pillars to Islamic belief. The first one is the profession of faith, called the shihada, and you've probably heard this. It translated, and, and I, I can do part of it in Arabic, but I'm not going to try today. Um, translated, it is, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. So it establishes the unique divinity and authority of Allah as God, just as the first of the Ten Commandments does. And then it establishes that the prophet of God is Muhammad. Now let me explain. The, the Quran identifies multiple prophets through history, including Abraham, Muhammad, or Moses, and Jesus, who's called Isa or Isa. Um, all of them are considered prophets of God. Jesus is not considered to be divine in Islam, but he is considered to be a prophet. In fact, a higher level than just prophet is messenger. This could be translated, the Shahada could be translated, that uh, Muhammad is his messenger. Because messengers were the ones that brought the word of God to people. Moses brought the law. Jesus didn't write it himself, but he brought the truth of God that got written down by his followers, just like Muhammad's followers wrote down the Quran that he, he recited. The messengers bring the word of God. Islam believes Judaism worshiped the right God, and Christianity worshiped the right God, but through the process of the centuries, those religious beliefs got corrupted, and the religious writings, while they're respected, it's believed that the Hebrew Bible and the Christian Bible got corrupted, and that through the Quran, God spoke through Muhammad the corrections to the corrupted uh, Jewish and Christian writings, all right? So that's one, is uh, the Shahada, the statement of faith. Oh, second is fasting, especially during the holy month of Ramadan. Some of our guides talked about that for one month, and that changes every year. It's not one month every, it, it, it goes back 10 days every year. And so over a period of time, the whole year will be the month of Ramadan. And so Ramadan, you are not, not supposed to eat from sunrise to sunset as an act of discipline and of denying yourself. There is also um, uh, prayer five times daily, and you will hear, if you haven't already, you will hear the call to prayer. Five times at, dawn, at uh, daybreak, mid-morning, noon, mid-afternoon, and evening, there is a call to prayer. And that call basically restates the, the shahada. There is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. It says that a couple of times, and a couple of times it says, God is great, God is great, and then it says, come to prayer, come to prayer. That's why they call it the call to prayer. And it repeats those things. There is also uh, the admonition, the fourth pillar is generous almsgiving, to give generously, to care for the needs of the poor, of the widows and others. And the pilgrimage, or hajj, once in your lifetime, if you're Muslim, you are expected to go to, um, to Mecca to do a pilgrimage. And this is a picture of the pilgrimage. That black box in the middle is actually a, a, a building that is covered with, with uh, fabric, you know, gilded fabric. That was a, the belief of, the, of Muslims is that that was first built by Adam. The Adam, okay. And it was later destroyed. It was rebuilt by Abraham and his son Ishmael, who came to Mecca. And later on, when Muhammad went to Mecca, he went into the, uh, where they had polytheistic idols in there. And Muhammad went into the Kaaba, it's called. The Kaaba is that big black square. And you'll notice that there are people all around it. They circle it uh, counterclockwise um, several times as part of the Hajj or the pilgrimage. Um, in the Jewish belief, or the Jewish, in the Islamic belief, as I said, they, they, the statement of faith is there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. The foremost article of faith amongst Muslims is Taweed, which is the unity, the singularity of God. The only unpardonable sin, according to the Quran, is to have anything else that you worship or that you consider equal to God or that you, and, and that's called shirk. 
like shirk, that's to take anything and think it's more important than God, or equal to God, Allah. Now, all three uh, Abrahamic beliefs have commonalities. They all came from the same source. In addition to seeing Abraham as the father, all of them believe in there, there is one true God. And in fact, they all think it's the same God. They really do. Um, except Jews and Muslims think that the Christians are really polytheists because we added you know, Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And by the way, the Holy Spirit is an Old Testament concept. Somebody asked me about that. The first part of the book of Genesis, the first book, says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So the start of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, has the Spirit. Periodically throughout the, the, the Hebrew Bible, the Spirit comes upon especially prophets to inspire their writing, you know, to direct them. And so this idea of the Spirit, while it's not, it's not identified as a different person in the Hebrew Bible in the same way, the Spirit of God as a particular manifestation of Yahweh God is in the Old Testament. So the idea of Christianity, that there is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit combined in one God, um, conservative Judaism and, and Islam does not agree with that part of it. But there is a sense there is one true God. All of life, it's commonly held, especially all people, are made by God, who is the creator and sustainer of life. And social justice and concern for others is critical. That's why these are called ethical monotheistic religions. All three of them focus on how we treat each other. That if God is a good and moral and righteous and holy and loving God, then we should seek to be that way, not only in reaction to Him, but how we treat each other. Other religions do not have that, surprisingly. People are shocked by that, in terms of the, the polytheistic religions. The place where they disagree is they disagree on the nature of the human condition. Christianity, especially, has a concept of original sin that I described to you. Islam does not have a concept of original sin. In fact, the reason they don't believe Jesus was divine, that he wasn't the savior, that he didn't die to remove people's sins, is because they don't believe in original sin. The only sins you have are the ones you're committing, and the way to stop doing it is to be good. Orthopraxy, right practice. They do not have a concept of sin in the same way. Judaism, to be disobedient to God, to not obey his law, is the nature of sin in that. There's no inherent fallenness necessarily. The second is the nature of the afterlife, or salvation. Um, Christianity and Islam both have a sense of an afterlife, which is a paradise. Um, you've heard that uh, Islamic terrorists are told that they're going to go to paradise right away and they'll have 49 virgins taking care of them and all that kind of stuff. There is a sense of afterlife, and there is a sense of hell. There is a judgment day in Islam, as there is in Christianity. For the Jewish people, they're, depending on, again, the, the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees disagree on this, and there's some disagreement amongst the various sections. There is Reformed Judaism, Conservative Judaism, there's various kinds of Judaism today, um, but the um, and Orthodox Judaism, but the belief of some of the Jews is that there is an afterlife, that there will be, and Maimonides believe that there will be resurrection of the dead, and there will be an afterlife. And the, the nature of that, it's, a, it's described differently than what Christian or Islam describes it as. As I said, salvation, historically speaking for the Jewish people, has, come, has been a return from exile. And literally, Maimonides talked about the dead being raised was a return from the exile of death. But the idea of returning to the promised land, the, the land of Israel, the promised land, is still the promised land. And in fact, Jews believed that in the 1940s, 1947, when the nation of Israel was declared and Jews began to come back there, that that was the start, not the finish, but the start of the fulfilled promise of return, that the Jewish people would return from exile to the land promised to them from the start. Questions about any of that? Did I scare you? Yes? Why would it not be then that the Jewish people would strive to make that return. Well, why would it be that the Jewish people would not strive to make that return? It would be. Two of the great historic beliefs of the Christian faith were belief in the, in the expectation of a Messiah and the expectation of a return to the Promised Land. Over a period of time, the belief in the Messiah diminished. Some people you know, stopped really having that expectation and sort of replaced it with a, a stronger emphasis on return to the Promised Land, which is the word that's used for that is Zionism. Zion was the ancient word for Jerusalem. 
And so Zionism, which I'm speaking neutrally here, that has a negative connotation to some people, but the Zionistic expectation was that the Israel, uh, the people of Israel, the Jewish people, would return to uh, the Promised Land. And so that Zionistic expectation has always, since since the Babylonian exile first, and then later the the diaspora after the Jewish destruction of the temple, the expectation of a return to the Promised Land has always been part of the Jewish faith. And Zionism is and more recently. I mean, that's only been in the last 150 years or so that that word has been actively used for that. Other questions? Yes. Where do you attribute the fact that 22 uh, percent of the Jews uh, receive Nobel Prize? Um, the Jew, why are why are the Jews why have they been so successful Nobel prizes and why are they successful the Jewish people have always had an emphasis on education when literacy was rare everywhere else every Jewish boy at least and often girls but that you know the, you saw Yentl there were sometimes were problems with that uh, every Jewish boy was taught to read it was a necessary rite of passage at age, during the bar mitzvah at age 13 to stand up in front of the congregation and read from the scrolls the, of the Torah. So they're all well educated. There is a sense amongst the Jewish faith, uh, some of it has been because, I believe, because of the persecution of the Jewish people, the sense of survival means excellence. You excel as, as a Jew. Now, I'm not Jewish, so somebody correct me if you think I'm wrong about this. But I believe that's part of it. But the the um, the absolute focus on excellence, intelligence, um, no less than uh, Albert Einstein said that I think he said I thank God for the Jewish drive to excel and exceed and go beyond, which is part of the Jewish tradition. He said I thank God that I'm a Jew because without that I would not have been able to do any of the things I've done. So it is inherent in the nature of the Jewish people, in the history of the Jewish people, the traditions that they excel. And we ought to be grateful for that because they have contributed more to Western civilization. They're 0.2% than probably most other hundreds of millions of groups of people have. Thank God bless the Jews. And those of you who are Jews in the, in the audience, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Is that a fair representation of Judaism for the Jews that, I have in the, that we have in the group? Are we okay with that? Obviously, I can't get it all, you know, but um, any other questions? All right, I appreciate very much.